Ladies and gentlemen, I've genuinely got a huge show for you today with Dana White calling Mark Zuckerberg a gangster after him getting the inside scoop on Meta's board meetings. Dan Ives listing through the huge opportunity AI is presenting humanity. And then a final clip on why Jensen is such an extraordinary leader leading arguably the most important company in the world right now. Brace yourself for three banger clips. And now AI. Have you got into AI yet? We're dabbling. Okay. I'm trying, yes, sir. So Meta AI, I got, you know, I'm on the board for Meta. I just got back from a Meta board meeting. Zuckerberg, who is a brilliant gangster, this guy is yes, a sir. gangster. These people who, who, who try to talk about him and everything else. I'm so blown away and impressed by this guy. He's an animal and uh, putting all the chips in on AI. We just hired like 10 kids that are age 22 to 28, the average salary is like $65 million that these kids are making that are coming and working on AI. But AI, you know, you hear a lot of negativity about AI. There's way more positives about AI than negative. So you start looking at AI and getting into it and asking AI, how do I build my business? How do I, you know, and it'll start giving you some ideas and uh, you can create agents inside AI that update you every day on your business and 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 giving you ideas mm. on how to take uh, everything to the next level in 26. So you should just be thinking about leveling up in 26. Set a goal, right? If if you want to drive from here to Tulsa, Oklahoma, you'd have to go on a map and you'd have to lay out, you know, your route and all. You got to do the same thing for your business. Map out your route for 26 and figure out where you want to be as you go into 27. Yeah. How, and get it done. How do, how do you, how do you, uh, how are you applying to AI? I mean, like in what, like, I know we're using it to help with graphic design. We're using it a little to help on editing a video, but is there something I'm missing? Yes. Like, all of that. So AI is only as good as the questions you ask it. Mm. Right. If you want to go on and use it for, Treat it like it's Google. You know what I mean? You're missing the boat. You, you, you can ask AI anything about your business. We'll f*** around with it a little bit when we're yeah. done yeah. with the podcast, and I'll kind of show you how you can. For sure. Yeah. Dana White's first-hand account of Mark Zuckerberg's leadership reveals why founder-led companies can make transformational bets that hired executives simply cannot. Dana White, sitting on Meta's board, describes Mark Zuckerberg as a brilliant gangster who's putting all the chips in on AI, even hiring young AI talent at average salaries of $65 million per year. What makes Dana White's perspective so valuable is that he's built one of the most demanding businesses in entertainment. Dana White literally operates in the fight business. Let's be honest, taming some of those high testosterone young fighters and building an organization around it must be probably one of the most erratic ventures you could possibly undertake. And bear in mind, it came from nothing and has pretty much defined a new sporting category. When someone with that background watches Mark Zuckerberg operate and comes away describing him as an animal, for me, I think that carries some weight. The hiring numbers Dana mentions are staggering. Meta is paying 22 to 28 year olds $65 million a year in average salaries to work on AI. Most corporate boards would never approve that kind of compensation for what might be arguably unproven talent. Most CEOs would face shareholder revolts for writing those kind of checks. Zuckerberg can do it because he controls the company, he answers to himself. And this connects to the broader thesis about founder-led businesses. When Zuckerberg decided the metaverse pivot was failing, he could course correct without getting fired. When he decided AI was the future, he could bet the company's resources on it. A hired CEO at a similar company would have spent six months building consensus, another six months getting board approval, and then execute a watered down version of the strategy. And this is why Dana's experience is so valuable. He built the USC from a struggling promotion into a global phenomenon by making bold, unconventional decisions. He recognizes that same energy in Zucks. The ability to go all in when you see an opportunity is what separates transformational leaders from caretaker managers who preserve the status quo. Now check out this clip from Dan Ives. 
How are we going to fuel these data centers? Is it going to be nuclear or is it going to be nuclear. solar or it's going to be nuclear? So, so right, the reality is, like to put it in numbers, 3% of U.S. companies have gone down the AI path. Okay. When you get to 20%, based on current energy, right. there, there's we nothing We run out left. of energy. You, you, you we, don't have enough. Okay. That would mean that you, based on the grid, people's lights would go out in their houses as data. You'd as data centers go online, our lights will go off. Yeah. So we are going to have to make a choice There's unless only, we find an alternative. And it's nuclear. To and me, it's nuclear. To me, nuclear, that's what China has right. done. Solar and grid could maybe do some things around the edges, but nuclear is ultimately going to be the answer for okay. the U.S. And I think right now, the only thing that stops or slows down the AI revolution right. in the U.S. is energy. Is that, is energy. It's not capital, right. use cases, right. demand. is this a bubble, right. demand, right. Right. it's, it's, it's energy. the energy. Okay, because at the end of the day, if you can't turn on the lights, you got nothing going on. You, and, can, build, you can build all the infrastructure, but if it can't run, it's, it's not, it doesn't have value. And I think a big area in 2026 is going to be like, how do you play energy? Who are names that could be the answer? That was my next question. And, and I think that's- Are you allowed to tell me? I mean, do you know, I mean, are there companies that come to, na to light that you can mention that would be so, so, new companies that actually support the nuclear like I think, uh, grid? I think GE Vernova is a good example. Right. That's I a think, GE spinoff, correct? Yeah, okay. I think um, Iron, I-R-E-N is another okay. example. Aqua clearly is a nuclear Aqua, play as one okay, of them. Okay, L-O. Um, okay, hello. But then, but then there's going to be many others that that maybe are private today okay. that I think will be public. And really? that's yeah. So the thing is, like that, that to me is going to be one of the biggest opportunities right. go, going forward. Uh, so anyway, we interviewed yesterday. There's a guy. There's a a magazine called Payload. Payload is a magazine uh, that deals with all of the stocks in the space space, mm -hmm. right? And then, where we were yeah. talking about the uh, SpaceX IPO. And then we were talking about tech, and he, yeah. we were the gentleman. He they've made a now an a, a arrangement with the NYSE okay. that they're going to be doing some stuff, analyzing a lot of the space okay. stocks that are here, Great. hoping to bring uh, uh, SpaceX IPO to the New York Stock Exchange. He did talk about data centers in space, right? Which is a fascinating thing, which is actually a thing now, right? It was never a thing no. because of the the risk was way offline. But recently, they've come to grips with the fact that solar, so what does it mean? Data centers in space means that you're going to build, you're going to use uh, a solar from space. If we're building yes. them in space, right? In space, apparently, there is nothing, there's no, nothing in, uh, that the efficiency of the solar energy source yep. up in up in space is huge, right? There's no impediments to it. There's nothing, you know, and there's no gravity in between it. So there's nothing blocking it. And that if we could take the risk out of that and build them, what, what's your feeling on that? Look, I mean, it's going to be, it's, it's another area we talk about where like, this is a fourth industrial revolution. Right. From space to nuclear, to energy, to AI, to the consumer, to autonomous, to robotics. Right. Like that's that's where it's all going. Like, look, I remember like, you know, you've always said during like liberation that we were going to Jetsons and then maybe that yeah, we, we were going like to Flintstones. The Flintstones. But we're going back to Jetsons. Right. You know, and when you look at the Jetsons, like that is real. You know, it was like that. It will become real in our lives. You said it when I met you the first day when I came to you and said, explain to me about AI. I don't get it. Our kids going to be outsourced, right? People are talking to me, youngsters, high school and college students are asking me, like, is this AI thing going to make it difficult for us to find jobs when we come out? And you said, absolutely, yeah. they're wrong because AI is going to benefit our lives way more than it's going to jeopardize our lives. Exactly. And there's going to be way more opportunity. Now, the opportunities may be a little bit different. It may be in the AI sector, but it's going to be a little different. And that speaks to the opportunities that, you know, I think as an investor, it's very easy to get short-sighted with just stock movements, right. you have to just be able to recognize like who are the winners, how do you play this market, right. and use sometimes the white knuckle moments to, to really, in my view, those are the golden opportunities. Yeah, so we've seen it, no we're not done yet, we've seen over the last year that we've gone through the ebbs and the flows. 
Dan Ives' argument that only 3% of US companies have adopted AI reveals we're at the very beginning of a transformation whose ultimate applications remain unknown. The 3% adoption figure should stop every investor in their tracks. If we're already seeing the infrastructure build out, the stock price appreciation and the market excitement at 3% penetration, what happens when that number reaches 10% or 20%? The market is pricing in growth, but it may be dramatically underestimating the scale of what's coming. What Dan identifies as the primary bottleneck shifts the entire investment conversation. Most bubble fears center on whether the technology will deliver ROI, whether demand is real, or whether competition will erode margins. Dan says none of those are the actual constraint. The real limiter is physical infrastructure. You can have unlimited demand, unlimited capital, and unlimited use cases if you cannot turn on the lights nothing else matters. And this creates a fascinating investment framework. The AI winners we can identify today are companies providing compute, software, and infrastructure. The AI winners of 2030 might be applications we cannot even conceptualize right now. When smartphones launched, nobody predicted Uber, DoorDash, or Instagram. The platform enabled business models that were literally unimaginable before the technology existed. And now to another magnificent company led by a killer founder. Here's a clip on Jensen. AI has turned out to be a heavy industry. I mean, we are brute forcing our way to smarter machines with these gigantic data centers that are filled with hundreds of thousands and sometimes millions of NVIDIA chips. You know, Jensen has described those as AI factories where it, uh, data goes in and intelligence comes out. And, and that's the world we live in now. Um, whether Jensen can maintain that central position with all of these competitors coming online, I guess, is a question we'll answer in the next couple of years. Yeah, so there, there's the company, NVIDIA, and there's also the man, right? And to Sherry's point a couple of seconds ago about uh, leadership, I mean, uh, mm -hmm. I think the job of most great leaders is to start thinking and planning for succession. That doesn't seem to be happening uh, at NVIDIA. Not I mean, okay, granted, soon, the, the no. guy, is just he's just past middle age. He's not that old, right? But, I mean, there is the whole issue of, of key man risk. Were you able to talk to him about that? And, and what did he say? I was. I was like, what's your succession plan? He's like, I don't have one. Simple as that. There's no designated successor. You know, if you look at a typical company, you've got one guy on top or one woman on top, and then you've got maybe 10 or 12 kind of like people answering to the chief executive. At, at NVIDIA, it's like 60 people, okay? Jensen's at the top. There's no second layer of management. And then the third layer is just like 60 or 70 people all answering to him. So how he manages to do that, it's sort of extraordinary. It's not what you expect from sort of classic modes of management. But he somehow is capable of just answering, you know, 10 or 15 times as many emails, responding to 10 or 15 times as, as initiatives, managing that many more people as anyone else. Now, part of the secret is that those executives are themselves extraordinarily capable. Jensen is surrounded by brilliant, brilliant people, and he drives them very, very hard. So he can go to one of his lieutenants and give them a task and say, come back in six months when you've completed this. I'm delegating all of this authority to you. Go do it and come back. And because he's been so careful about who he's hired, that can actually happen, which I think is rare at other companies and harder to do. But, you know, I talked to the members of the board a little bit, like, is there a succession plan? And one board member said, basically, look, we have a couple names in mind. We've thought about this issue a little, mm. but I'm going to be real with you. Jensen is irreplaceable. NVIDIA board members admitting Jensen Huang is irreplaceable illustrates again why investors should pay premium multiples for companies with exceptional founder-led leaders at the helm. The organizational structure Jensen has built would be dismissed as impossible by any business school professor. 60 direct reports with no middle management layer violates every principle of organizational design. Yet NVIDIA has executed flawlessly through the most demanding period in semiconductor history while operating this way. The key insight is that Jensen has been meticulously building this company for 30 years. He was designing chips for video games when most current tech executives were still in school. That institutional knowledge, those supplier relationships, that deep technical understanding, none of that can be transferred through a PowerPoint presentation during a CEO transition. So again, we're touching on a broader investment philosophy about founder-led companies. When you invest in NVIDIA, you're not just buying exposure to AI compute demand, you're buying Jensen's decision making, his ability to see around corners, his willingness to make massive bets on technology 
technology years before competitors recognized their importance. The CUDA ecosystem didn't happen by accident, nor the data center pivot. That didn't happen by accident either. These were deliberate strategy these were deliberate strategic choices made by someone who understood the technology at a fundamental level. NVIDIA's board admission that they thought about this issue just a little bit, but considered Jensen as irreplaceable, is remarkably and brutally honest. Most boards would offer some BS succession planning. The NVIDIA board have essentially said, we have no real plan because there is no real replacement. YouTube isn't just entertainment, it's one of the best client acquisition tools because it builds trust at scale. We've helped businesses grow from scratch to a $100,000 a month just by launching them a YouTube channel. Book a call with me below and let's see how YouTube could help your business scale.